Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the James Bible Study. I got a special guest. What is your name again? Josie. Josie what? Hammock. Josie. <laughs> That's good. Josie Mae Hammock. Okay, can you pray, pray us in tonight? Can you say, God bless you, everybody? God bless you, everybody. And have a great Bible study. And have a great Bible study. Do you remember how to put on your armor? We gird our waist with the belt of truth. We put on the shoes of the gospel of peace. We put on the breastplate of righteousness. We take up the shield of faith to quench all the arrows of the enemy. We put on the helmet of salvation. And we take up the sword of the spirit, the word of God. Amen. Bye, everybody. Tell everybody bye. Okay. We'll see you next time. I love you. Well, thank you. Our special guest has been saying, Papa, can I be on your Bible study? I said, come on, let's do it. So, hey, God bless you. Thank you for showing up tonight. It is a very special day. It is my father-in-law, Tommy Frierson's birthday. He is somewhere north of the big 7-0. We won't tell you how many, but uh, yeah, he's, 71. he's 71 today and he looks 61. And uh, so God bless you, Tommy. Thank you for your mighty influence in my life and the lives of many other men uh, and just people. If you need something fixed, Tommy's fixed it probably. If you need uh, something done, he's done it for you. He's a servant and a lover of people. So Tommy, happy birthday. God bless you. Thank you for being the best father-in-law, father influence in my life, uh, helping me learn how to play baseball change the oil in my truck, um, cook, all sorts of crazy stuff. Love you. God bless you. Hey, take your Bible. Turn it to James, the book of James. We're in James chapter 3 tonight. We are in session number 5. If you need notes to our sessions, they're on our uh, website, which is whitestonechurchtx.com. You can go there right now. You can download the notes to tonight's session. You can also go to the Contact Us page, give us your email, and we will send you those notes um, via email. So you can get on our mailing list. I think we have over 100 people on our email list right now, uh, and we also have them listed on our website, Whitestone Church TX. So God bless you. Let's pray. Grab your Bible, grab your notes, grab something to write with, and uh, we'll get started. So Father God, we love you. And God, we bless you, and God, we praise you, and God, we pray that you would open up our heart, open up our minds. God, we give to you the craziness of the day. We give to you all the stress and anxiety and worry and doubt that's going on in the world, God. And Father, we just pray that you would be our Prince of Peace. Pray that with me. Father God, be my Prince of Peace. Bring me peace that passes understanding, my ability to comprehend. In Jesus' name, and everybody said... Amen. So grab your Bible. We are in James chapter 3. And um, we're going to go, we're going to try to cover this entire chapter tonight. But I want to cover it from a surface level and then hopefully go to a much deeper level. So let's just read the first um, 12 verses. And it's James chapter 3, verse 1. It says, My brethren. Now remember when it says brethren, He's talking to the believer. He's not talking to a non-Christ follower. He's talking to brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. So this isn't a message for the world. This is a message for the church. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment, for we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word... He is a perfect man or woman. So just underline in your Bible, word. So we're going to talk a lot about word tonight. If no one stumbles in word, he is perfect man or woman, able to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body with that bit. We look also at ships, although they are so large and driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small propeller or rudder wherever the pilot desires. 
Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird and reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless God our Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude or similarity in God of God. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. My brethren, Cameron, put your name here, Whitestone Church, these things ought not be so. Does a spring also bring forth fresh water? Or bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh water. Before I go much further, I can't believe I forgot it. I want to say welcome to the world, Jericho. So my grandson was born two days ago, three days ago. And welcome to the world, Jericho. James Corbin, my son and his beautiful bride, Josh and Vanessa, had their firstborn child, uh, Jericho James Corbin. So welcome, Jericho. It's also his three-day birthday, if you will. So, But back to our text. The world is fed with our words. The world is populated with our words. James here, in the beginning of this chapter 3, is going straight for the juggler, saying, Hey, listen, your tongue is very powerful. The words that come out of your mouth have great weight. Proverbs says, Out of the mouth comes life or death. You have the ability to speak life or death over people over circumstances. You have the ability to praise God or to curse God. You have the ability to uplift or put down. You have the ability with this mouth. The, James says, hey, listen, a wild forest fire, the forest fires that take place in Colorado are started by a small spark. We all grew up with Smokey the Bear and only you can prevent forest fires. Well, unfortunately, some great forest fires have been started by a simple cigarette butt tossed out of, the, out of a car window or a single match that's tossed into some, some uh, uh, you know, underbrush and it starts a massive forest fire. Um, James brings up the point of a boat. Uh, the biggest cruise boats out there, the biggest war boats out there, warships, um, have been controlled or are controlled by these little rudders in comparison to the size of the boat. A regular boat has a very small prop or propeller that steers that boat. The tongue is a very small part of our body, but it rules and steers the body. It can boast things. Have you ever like uh, uh, said something you couldn't back up? Have you ever have you ever overcommitted with your tongue? Have you ever committed to something with your tongue first and then your mind goes, oh, oh my God, what did I just buy? What did I just commit to? Have you ever committed? Has your spouse ever committed you? And you're like, don't say that. Don't bring that. We didn't even talk about that. Have, have you ever said something with your tongue as a sharp reaction in the grocery store to somebody or at work or on a ball field and you're like, whoa, where did that come from? Have you ever just used your tongue in a way that you're like, oh, I should not have said that. Have you ever done something where, it, where it's like, you know, well, I'm just saying what everybody else is thinking. Well, our tongue has the ability to control us or bring us into a great position or a bad position. 
James goes on to say, listen, we've tamed every animal in the world. We've captured eagles. We've captured lions. We've captured whales. We've captured every type of beast that's in the ocean or on the land or in the air, and we've harnessed them. We've controlled them by putting them in a cage or putting a bit in the horse's mouth and we steer them, we break them, we, we train them to do what we want them to do. But nobody has been able to tame the tongue. So James says, listen, if you can control what you say, you're a perfect man or woman, you'll actually be able to control your whole body. So let's go to some other verses real quick. Go with me to Proverbs chapter 18, verse um, 7. I forgot what verse it is. It's in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 7, I believe. I'll look it up real quick. Proverbs uh, chapter 18. I didn't write down the verse in our notes. Well, I forgot what verse it is. Just look in Proverbs 18 somewhere. And yeah, 21. 21. Proverbs 18, verse 21. It says this, Death and life, say that out loud, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of Cameron's tongue. If you're around me long enough, I'll say really good life-giving things to you. But if you catch me at the wrong time, in the wrong mood, in the wrong position, I may just say something that's giving life to you. So the dichotomy of the Christian life is trying to control our tongue where when we speak, we only speak what brings life. So say life. Look at, um, we're going to skip the second note for a second, but look at um, Proverbs 23. And I want to get here. And then kind of backtrack a little bit. Look at Proverbs 23. And again, I forgot to write the verse down. I don't know what's wrong with me. Proverbs 23, verse 7. Proverbs 23, verse 7. For as a man thinks, so he is. Have you ever heard that? As a man thinks, so he is. For as a man thinks, so he is. But let's read the actual verse out of the scripture because there's a part of it that we don't usually include. It says, For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. For as a man or woman thinketh in his heart, so is he. I want to talk about the body, the soul, and the spirit for a minute. I want to talk about the three-part person and how what we say is actually representing or manifesting what's in our heart. So we are a three-part person, and, and we've talked a couple times about this, a three-part person. We're made in the image of God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But we as people are a body. So say body. This is your body. The inward man or woman is your soul. So everybody has a soul. We have a mind, a will, and an emotion. And then the third being, the third part of us, is our spirit. So I want to talk to us about what controls our tongue. Your tongue is a physical part of your physical body. If we cut your tongue off, then your physical body would not be able to form words and to articulate through the vocal box and the vocal cords and, and to push air out of our mouth forming words. You may form English words or Russian words or Mandarin words or Portuguese words. Depending upon the words that you form with your mouth, it comes from the inward part of who you are. So you were taught as a young child how to speak. You were taught, some of us had to go to speech therapy because we may have had a cliff pellet or we may have had um, a speech impediment. Some of us needed to go to therapy. Some of us needed our mouths cleaned out with soap 
because what we spoke wasn't very good. And so our mamas cleaned our, washed our mouths out with soap. We were taught how to speak. We were taught manners. We were taught to say, yes, sir, no, ma'am. You know, thank you. You're welcome. We were taught these things to, to articulate what's on the inside of who we are. So Proverbs 23 says, For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Your tongue speaks what's in your heart. So when we talk about the soul level of who we are, let's really get down into, because I could, I could spend a lot of time on saying, hey, listen, you got to speak right. You got to not blaspheme God. It's not, it's not accurate for you to, to blaspheme, to worship God and then walk out and, and cuss out the waitress that messed up your order at Sunday lunch. It's not proper. I mean, we could stay up here on this surface level, but let's kind of dig deep and figure out what is influencing our tongues because our tongue themselves is just a physical muscle in our body. And this tongue only says what my heart thinks. This tongue only says what my soul tells it to say. I want you to write that down. Body, soul, spirit. And under the word soul, I want you to put mind, will, and emotion. Now, Miles Monroe, uh, my friend Rhonda Hendren sent me this great message by Miles Monroe. And it's, it's, um, it's the uh, mandate of the media. So if you go to YouTube, you can listen to it an hour and a half. And he'll do a really good job and go much deeper than I'm going to go right now on this topic. But it's a great listen on YouTube. Miles Monroe, The Mandate of the Media. It's about an hour and a half message that he gave. But, but the Lord's been revealing to me for a while now about the importance of the soul. The spirit inside of you, which is right here underneath your chest, it's where your diaphragm is, we would call it our gut. But we don't have a gut, we have a spirit. And we either have the Holy Spirit in us or we have an unholy spirit in us. You and I, we are spirit beings in a physical shell. When our physical shell, when our body dies, which all of our bodies are deteriorating day after day, minute after minute, we are growing older. And what we mean by growing older is we are coming to our end, or we are expiration date is getting closer every, every breath that we take. Now, our bodies are not being saved. When you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, He saves your spirit, your soul. He saves the inward man or woman. He cares about your body. He heals your body from cancer. He heals broken bones. He heals deaf ears and blind eyes. But He does that on a temporal basis because at some point, something's going to take your physical life. At some point, your heart will attack or your mind will cease or your your uh, whatever your whatever's going to happen to you, you're going to end, and at that last breath, your spirit and soul are going to depart from your physical body. Now, those two spiritual beings that make up who you are, the Bible says, will inhabit a spiritual, eternal shell or new body that will not die but will live forever in one of two places, heaven or hell. But while we're on earth, our tongue is controlled by our mind, will, and emotion, our soul. Our soul is influenced by our spirit. So if I have the Holy Spirit inside of me, the Holy Spirit will say, hey, Cameron, don't repeat that joke. Hey, Cameron, don't use your words to tell that person what you really think. Hey, Cameron, I know that they just cursed you, but you shut your mouth and do not form words to curse them back. Hey, Cameron, don't sing those lyrics to that song. Oh, I know it's the best number one seller of all time, 
but don't allow those words to formulate on your tongue because what you speak, Cameron, represents what's in your heart. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. It's very interesting that scripture doesn't say, for as a man thinketh in his mind. Your heart is what we would say is influenced or really your soul. The heart of the man, the heart of the woman. Love me, the, Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love the Lord with everything inside of you. I just said that wrong. I got to think about that verse for a minute. Um, but, but God's saying, love him with everything inside of you. God is saying this. What is influencing your soul? Words are extremely important. Words are how the world was created. In the beginning, God said, let there be light. Let there be trees. Let there be dolphins. Let there be grass. He, he spoke the world into existence. Well, his words were originally his thoughts. And his thoughts are originally representing his heart. So our thoughts represent what's in the subconscious man, the heart of the man or woman. Our thoughts reveal themselves sometimes in the middle of the night through dreams. Sometimes you wake up dreaming and you're like, man, where did that dream come from? Well, it came from the thoughts that originate in your heart, not just your mind. So here, here's what I'm trying to say. If I tell you, thank you, honey. Here's the verse. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love others as yourself. Here's, here's the point. Your soul is influenced by outside information. So if I tell you over and over and over as a child, you're stupid, you're stupid, you're dumb. You are, you, you are the slowest kid in the class. Hey, you're one fry short from your Happy Meal, buddy. You're, the, you're not the sharpest tool in the shed. If, if a child is told those words, then they will start to believe those words in their mind first. But their mind will sell or influence their heart to believe that information. And then that child will speak what's in their heart. The reason words like, I hate you, hurt so much from somebody you love is because you know it came from their heart. You also have heard people say to you, I hate you but you know it came from their mind, so you didn't believe it. But when you heard them say, I hate you from your, their heart, it hurt you. You've heard people say, I love you from their mind, but you didn't believe it. But when they said, I love you from their heart, then you believed it. So, so if we start there and we say, okay, what influences our heart? Well, our mind influences our heart. Well, what influences our mind? Television, music, books, gossip, stories, politicians, teachers at the finest universities, they are influencing on our mind. And they're either giving us information that's holy or unholy. They're either feeding us truth or lies. So when their mind, when our minds are influenced by that information, when we continue to receive that information and we then we start to believe it in our heart, then we will speak it. Have you ever heard somebody talk about something they don't know what they're talking about? You ever heard, heard somebody, you ever said, man, I, I just, man, I, I don't know what to do with my car. Um, I, I need, I need, you know, I need to fix my car. And then somebody that doesn't know anything about cars 
just start spouting out information. Well, that information came from their mind. They just heard somebody say something and somebody else said something. And so they regurgitated what they heard. But a true mechanic would, would say, hey, listen, this information on how to fix your problem, it's in my heart. It's in my being. And so when I bring that out, it really is the essence of, of who I am. I am a mechanic. I know what I'm talking about. When somebody doesn't know what they're talking about, you may listen to them, but you're going, oh, this is nothing. This is crazy. But when it's from their heart, then you grab onto it and you say, I want that. Now, what influences the heart is what influences the mind first. So if I'm continuously, continuously, if I continue over and over and over, how do I say that word? Continuously. If I continuously feed my mind, trash in the form of music then my heart will start to receive that which my mind is full of and out of my heart I'll speak Jesus says it's not what, defi what goes in defiles you it's what comes out and what comes out is a product of what comes in now when he makes that statement, he's talking about food. So in this statement, I'm talking about media or what comes into our mind. And here's, here's what James is trying to say. He's trying to say, listen, when you talk, it is a representation of what's in your heart. And what's in your heart is the information that's been going over and over in your mind. So if you walk around the house and you say, Ah, I'm so stupid. Cameron, that's just stupid. You're so stupid. Well, all of a sudden, I have to ask myself, where did that come from? Well, was the information fed to my mind as a child that my actions equal my value? So if I spill the milk, I'm stupid. If I... If I uh, break the glass or drop the thing or I forget to put the item in the right place then my value goes down so somewhere in my heart I believe that I have no value if I don't do the right things so then when I do the wrong thing or I make a simple mistake or an accident then what comes out of my mouth is a representation of what's deep into my heart so as a man thinketh in his heart so is he and when I speak it I'm feeding it back to my mind that feeds it back to my heart then it takes it feeds it to my tongue and I speak what's in my heart I know this is a, a I'm not I don't feel like I'm doing the best job of explaining this so I'm, I'm trying to get this through to all of us that that when I continue to watch on the news, when I feed my mind the politician's viewpoint of the world, when I continue, to, when I listen to more Fox News or CNN than, than the scripture, then my mind is continually bombarded with what bad things are happening in the world. So all of a sudden, that information will sink into my heart. And then out of my heart, I'll speak the bad things that are going on in the world. And so I won't speak the kingdom things, I'll speak the worldly things. And when I speak them, then I'm hearing them again, and it's going back into my mind, it's influencing my mind, and it goes into my heart, and then I say them again. And then that cycle is over and over and over and over and over. In Romans it says, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. There's a really cool story in Scripture where a man named Jarius, his daughter is dying. And Jarius takes the trip on foot to go find Jesus. The Bible doesn't tell us how far the trip was, but I think it was probably a, a, a pretty good journey in those days on foot. And so this man named Jairus, he goes to where Jesus is, the town that Jesus is at. 
And Jesus just healed the lady that had an issue of blood. And Jairus breaks through the crowd and he says, Jesus, I need you. Now listen to this. Look on your notes. It's in Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. While Jairus, Mark chapter 5, verse 35. While Jairus was still speaking, uh, or let me, let, me, let me start here. While Jesus, while he was still speaking, some came, uh, let me back up. While Jairus was still speaking, some came from the ruler's house and said, Jairus, now look, they said, they said with their words, Jairus, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word, look at your Bible. As soon as Jesus heard the word, what word? The word of death. Well, where did these people hear that the daughter died? Well, somebody mentally, somebody verbally said, she just breathed her last, she's dead. So it went from their mind quickly to their heart. And they may have started crying. They may have started being uh, sorrowful. But they went to find Jairus and they spoke what was in their heart and said, they're dead. Jesus says, when he heard the word, look at verse 36. As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, do not be afraid. Only believe. In other words, don't believe their word. Jairus, you're at this pivotal point. Your soul is now being influenced. Your soul is either going to listen to the report, the verbal report of your servants. And the verbal report of the servants is your daughter's dead. But I am the word of God. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. And the word became flesh. Jesus is the word of God. So the word of God, Jesus said, Jairus, don't believe their word. Don't believe. Don't let that report enter your mind and then enter your heart. Because your heart is where your faith is also. Because you'll speak your faith. Now, how do we speak our faith? Because hearing, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. When I speak the Word of God and I speak the faith of God, it's because I'm banking on the Word of God more than the Word of man or myself. So Jesus says, listen, do not be afraid, only believe. And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Then when they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, there was a tumult and those who wept and wailed loudly. When he, Jesus, came in, he says, Why do you make this commotion? The girl is asleep, not dead. They ridiculed and laughed at him, so he put everybody outside except mom and dad and his three disciples and he goes to the little girl and he says, Talitha Kumai, which is tra translated, Little girl, I say to you, rise up. And immediately the girl rose up, for she was 12 years of age. Here's my point. There is a word being spoken from hell. And that word comes through the television. It comes through people. It comes through books and media. It comes through sources that are painted up to look good but that information hits your mind it goes to your heart and then it comes out of your mouth so what comes out of your mouth is an indication of your heart it's an indication of the soul man or woman your soul is trapped between your body and your spirit so that a lot of times you'll say something and the spirit of god will say don't say that you need to go ask them to forgive you. Well, they deserve to get a piece of my mind. No, no, no. No, they didn't. Because that piece of your mind isn't as a man thinketh in his heart. You didn't give them your mind. You gave them your heart. And what's in your heart isn't life. It's death. It's corrupt. So therefore, you got offended that fast. You got offended and you got... You got displaced by their actions. And so you had to go defend yourself and you had to go stand up for yourself and you had to go rip them a new one and you had to go put them down with your words because your heart is corrupt. The inward soul of you, Cameron, is, is in great bondage because of what you've been listening to. The power of our words. 
Think about this. And, I, and so I'm not picking on any genre of music when I say this. I'm not picking on, you know, uh, rock and roll is of the devil. Country is of the devil if it's speaking of the devil. Classical is of the devil if it's speaking of the devil. Pop is, or rap is of the devil if it's speaking of the devil. It's not the, the form of the music. It's the words being spoken. When you fill an auditorium with 20,000 people, and it could be country, rock, rap, soul, you know, uh, disco, it could be whatever genre you want. But when the singer is putting out words glorifying sex and the corruption of the body, glorifying hardening your heart, glorifying drugs, glorifying death, glorifying what I just label sex, drugs, and rock and roll, then that singer, that, that musician has the ability to, everybody put your hands up. So everybody puts their hands up. Everybody say this with me and everybody says this with them. And they may be blaspheming God, talking about their stairway to heaven under an acid trip. Or they may be talking about sleeping with somebody that's not their wife because that's, that's who you know they lost in Amarillo by morning. And, and whatever, I'm just throwing them out there. I'm just making up things. It, it could be rock, rap, country. I don't care. But when that person puts their words out, they are swaying and influencing 20,000 people. And so those 20,000 people allow those words to go from their mind into their heart. So now all of a sudden they start to view the world very differently. So now the words they speak become much more cynical, are much more vile, are much more uh, um, angry, are much more, and you fill in the blank. It, it, it doesn't matter the, the mode, but what comes out of our mouth is a very clear indication of the condition of your heart. And the condition of your heart is influenced by the spirit that you listen to. When Cameron listens to the Holy Spirit, I will speak holy. When I listen to the unholy spirit of the enemy, I will speak unholy. I have been in situations where I've gotten irritated and, and or mad or scared. And I've said something and Stacy goes, Cameron, I've never heard you talk like that. And it's not acceptable. It's not like, well, I'm just having a bad day. No, no, no. It may be 1%. 3%, 10%. That percentage is in my heart. And that percentage, if it goes unchecked and undealt with, it will grow because it is a cancer in my soul. And it's not just going to stay at 1%. In a week, it'll be 2%. In three weeks, it'll be 6%. In a month, it'll be... And slowly, my... Bitterness will overtake me. Slowly my jealousy will overtake me. Slowly my prejudice. Slowly my greed. Slowly my whatever. So when I speak things like, Stacy, I can't believe that preacher has got 10,000 people going to his church. Have you ever heard him preach? He must be, he's just ridiculous. So all of a sudden I'm putting down somebody I don't even know. I just heard him on TV once. Everybody else puts them down. But, but all of a sudden, the words in my heart are revealing jealousy and envy. And God's saying, Cameron, what spirit are you listening to? I didn't ask you to pastor that church. I didn't ask you to be that evangelist. I didn't, I didn't call you to be that musician. I didn't call you to be the president of that college. You, trust me, he didn't. Uh, I didn't. I didn't call you to write that book. I, that's not what I have for you. And so all of a sudden, my heart is revealed by the words I speak. That's what James is saying. We go to church, oh, how great is my God, how great is my God. And then we get out the door, and our tongues start to, to curse the person that wore the short skirt or the flip-flops or Susie that, you know, uh, 
how dare her come to church after four divorces and and you know drug addiction and all this stuff and and so we start to tell our spouse things or our family things or we just start to tell ourselves things see here 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 it is there's the parable of the sower the parable of the sower Jesus says and I put it in our notes you'll have to read it on your own it's Matthew um, 13 Matthew 13 look at I'll just I'm not gonna read this whole parable but I'm gonna just encapsulate it but Matthew 13 chapter chapter 13 verse 3 Jesus spoke many things to them in parables now Jesus did he healed he walked on water he fed he did things but he also spoke things now listen to this parable Jesus spoke many things to them in parables. And he says this, Behold, a farmer went out to sow seed. And he sowed some, and it fell on the wayside, and the birds came and ate them. He sowed another, and it fell on stony places. He didn't have much earth. Then he, fell, he, he sowed some other seed over here, and he sowed some seed over here in good soil, and it grew 30, 60, 90, 100% crops, or 100 times the, the, the seed. And everybody's going, okay, thanks, Jesus, for the agricultural lesson. Thank you for the farmer lesson. I, okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, if you throw seed on concrete, it won't grow. <laughs> if you throw some seed in two inches of dirt, yeah, you, it ain't going to grow very good. Uh, okay, Jesus, birds eat seed. We get it. Okay, thank you so much. Oh, yeah, if you sow some seeds in deep soil, it'll sprout up and really grow a crop that produces 30, 60, 100 fold. Now, Jesus goes on and says this. I just pointed my finger at you. Jesus goes on to, to say this. Verse 19. His disciples pull him to the side and say, Jesus, what the heck are you talking about? Jesus says, here's the seed. Now, please hear this. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom, the word of God equals the seed. The word of the devil equals seed. When you hear the word, he says, when they heard the word and they don't understand it, the wicked one comes and takes it out of their heart. When it falls on the wayside, when, it, when he receives the seed on stony places, he who hears the word is extremely and immediately filled with joy, but he has no root, but endures only for a while. When tribulation persecution, persecution arises, the word immediately stumbles. He, it's pulled away from him. Now, some people hear the word of God, and it plants deep in their heart. This is what Jesus is saying. Many of us, we go to church, or we're reading the Bible, and we'll hear the word of God. But we won't let it sink into our heart. We'll keep it in our mind. And we'll kick it out because circumstances or the devil will put another word into our heart, our mind, and kick it out. We've got to let the word of God sink into our heart, but it's got to come into our mind first. So the enemy's word, he hits your mind too. And some of us have the enemy's word growing in our heart, producing a crop that is 30 times the seed, 60 times the seed, 100 times the seed. Some of us have the word of God in our heart, and it's producing. Some of us are growing both words. Some of us are, are so diverse in our walk with God that, that one day we're hot and the next day we're cold because we're not uprooting seeds of the enemy. A lot of believers struggle with self uh, uh, um, words of, of deprecation, self, if, if that's the right word. We, we, we put ourselves down. I'm fat. I'm stupid. God could never use me. God won't use me. See, we went to church and the preacher was saying how God made us on purpose. And he's quoting scripture saying, you didn't come from a monkey. You came from the voice of God, the creation of God. And he made you with intent and he made you on purpose and he's got a plan for you. And God wants to use you. And so we leave church going, God wants to use me. God's got a plan for me. God wants to use me. But deep in our heart... The seed of Satan was sown years ago that says, God will never forgive you for the reason you went to jail. 
God will never forgive you if anybody found out why you, you didn't go to jail, but you should be in jail for what you did. God will never use you because you're fat, you're ugly, you're skinny, you're tall, you're short, you're uneducated, you don't have teeth. Nobody will listen to you. See, God's word is in a battle with the devil's word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. God spoke the world into existence. Jesus said, you speak to this mountain, and it will be removed. He didn't say tithe, and the mountain will be removed. He didn't say fast and, and at with sackcloth and ashes. And He said, speak to the mountain and it will be removed. How could that be possible? Because there's power when the words that come out of your mouth come from the throne of God. There are seeds in our heart that are producing words. They're producing fruit. So when we get mad at our spouse and we start to use the B word and we start to cuss and mumble at them under our breath and we say, well, they don't work as hard as I work and they didn't even recognize what I did and Blah, 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 blah. Those, are, those aren't just emotion. Oh, I'm just emotional, Pastor Cameron. I just kind of say what I think. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Have you ever said, my wife is a nag? Or my husband is a lazy bum? As you think in your heart, you'll be it, and you'll speak it about other people. And if we're not careful, our words will influence them in a route to death, and they will start to be what we speak about them. See, when we put down our education system, the Lord has convicted me on little sayings that I've said just to be funny. I used to say, and I'm not saying I'll never say it again, but I used to say, oh, you know, I'll, I'll mess something up in my grammar or I'll mess something up and, and I'll say, oh, I went to public school. Well, I used to say that and I've said it a lot in my sermons and you can probably find old recordings with me saying that. But the Lord one day said, Cameron, when you say that, you are speaking death over all public school teachers and the public school system. And you are regurgitating something that was planted in you that wasn't from the Holy Spirit. When I say things like, I'm an alcoholic, I've always been an alcoholic, I'll always be an alcoholic. Well, because that's what AA told me, and that's what the doctor told me, and that's what the counselor told me. And that's just the truth, man. I'm just an addict. Well, when I say that, see, the enemy punched that through my mind and it got down into my heart. And so down in my heart, I'm thinking I'm an addict. So therefore, I'm going to produce addict behavior. And God's saying, listen, Cameron, I didn't save you to be an addict. I made you born again. I reinvented you. Now listen, Cameron, you used to be an addict, and you struggle with addiction. You struggle with wanting to go drink 48 beers Friday night. You struggle with wanting to eat 48 jelly-filled Krispy Kreme donuts. You struggle with wanting to go do those things. But Cameron, that's not who you are. So you've got to get my word down it through your mind into your heart. So there is a lot of times when I'm reading the Bible that I'll say, God, I just need this to get into my mind. God, and I don't need to just regurgitate it. I need it to get way down in here so that when I speak it, it's real. Stacy and I have been in this challenge to memorize Psalms 91. Now, for those of you that are great memory people, you may laugh at this. But it has taken me about two and a half years to memorize this chapter. And I'm all the way down. To, I've got like one more verse. But I made this commitment to the Lord. I don't want to just memorize it so that I could say it in my mind. I want to memorize it so I'll believe it in my heart. And it says this. 
He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. So I have been praying, God, show me the secret place. God, where's this secret place with you? God, he who dwells, I want to dwell. I don't want to dwell in my house. I don't want to dwell in Austin, Texas. I don't want to be known as just a Texan. I want to be known as a kingdom dweller in the house of the Lord. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide in the shadow of the Lord, of the Almighty. And I will say, he is my fortress, my refuge, my God in whom I will trust. Surely he'll deliver me from the snare of the fowler, the trapper of birds, the, the devil. Surely, surely when I put my foot in a trap, surely when I overcommit with my tongue, surely when I sin, God will deliver me. See, so when I'm memorizing this scripture, I'm not just trying to memorize it in my mind. I'm trying to get it down into my heart. Because then in my heart, in my subconscious man, I'll think that. And when I think it, I'll be it. I'll produce it. See, our words are vital. They're vital to our warfare. When I take authority over the enemy, in the name of Jesus, devil out of my house. Fear, I don't know how I let you in. Fear, I don't know why I've been entertaining you for the last 17 hours, worried how I'm going to pay my bills. Fear, I don't know why I'm letting you influence my blood pressure and getting me all worked up over, uh, you know, is the stock market crashing today? What's the, what's the spot price of gold today? Because I'm heavily invested. And God, what's all my customers saying? And when I give in to that fear, it may take me 17 hours to recognize it. It may take me 17 days to recognize it. But when I recognize it, because in my heart, I know that when I speak from my heart, devil out in the name of Jesus. I'm not just saying a prayer that's in my mind. Like, oh my God, oh my God, Lord, just tell the devil to leave and, and God, just do these things. And God, if you're really listening to me, then I hope you'll tell the devil to leave. And that's from my mind. That's not from my heart. I'm going to speak what's in my heart. That's what James is saying. He's saying, can a spring, so I'm, drink, I'm drinking Topo Chico, which I love. Stacy hates. This is Mexican water, by the way. Um, so Topo Chico comes from a source, a spring, for over 125 years somewhere in Mexico. I don't know. It's probably made in some guy's garage. I don't know where it's made, but at least they made me think that it comes from a spring. But if they go to this spring one day to, to, to bottle this mineral water, and one day the water's mineral water, but the next day it's pumping out ocean water. That's not possible. A spring puts out fresh water or salt water. An ocean has salt water. A lake has fresh water. God says, Jesus, James is saying this, Cameron, how can you produce out of your mouth? Worship one day and vile, disgusting perversion the next day. How can you say that you love me, but hate that guy because of his lifestyle? How can you worship me, but then go out and be rude to the waitress that was rude to you? How can you be two different people? Because in your heart, you've got to let my word get past your mind and into your heart. You've got to love me with all of your heart all of your soul, all of your strength, all of your mind. You've got to love me and let me produce in you this spring of life. I don't know. I hope, I hope this is halfway understandable tonight. I know that this is a heavy topic. And let me, let me speak what I believe. I know you're grasping the truth. I know God is speaking to our to our hearts. 
but I want you to gauge what you say. If we followed you around with a tape recorder 24 hours a day, what would we hear you say? Now, if, you, if you're worried about we're going to hear the F-bomb four times and this and that, it's deeper than that. What do you say about your finances? What do you say about your purpose? What do you say about your kids? What do you say about life? Do you believe or do you just not believe? Here's the problem with the day and age that we live in. And that video from Miles Monroe will, will really do great justice to the medium of social media. We live in a day and age that we crave knowledge. Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Adam and Eve crave this knowledge. And we think because we know a lot of stuff in our mind that it will make a difference. Kids believe in their heart and their minds don't even comprehend it. Hey, we're going to go get ice cream. Oh, great. And they'll jump up and down and scream for ice cream. But, but they don't even know where the money's coming for the ice cream. They don't know how to get to the ice cream store. They don't even know what time of day it is, if it's open or closed. They just believe in their heart because you told them because their mind doesn't even process the information. It just goes straight to their heart. God's saying, let his word go through your heart. Let the peace of Jesus Christ pass your understanding. You can, you can be at a funeral and your mind be wrecked because of the loss, but your heart can be at peace because Jesus is with you. Your heart is what speaks. So when we walk around and we say things that are unholy, we're confessing things that God says, my son or my daughter shouldn't confess those. And it's not just saying cuss words. It's confessing that your boss is not going to receive your report because he likes your coworker better. It's saying things like, my kids will never change, or my spouse will never change, or God, you know, we were born poor, we've been poor, we'll always be poor. Why would we say those things? Because somewhere down in our heart, we believe it. If you've ever thought about what your dreams are, a lot of times your dreams is your heart being revealed. A lot of times fear will come out in our dreams because we got fear in our heart. Perversion will come out because we've got perversion in our heart. Craziness, you know, all these things. I'm not saying every dream is a, but I'm just saying it's our subconscious man or woman, our heart is. And we're going to do how we think. How we think, how we think it in our heart, so we'll be. God wants you to speak with boldness what his words are. Back to James chapter 3 at the end in verse 11. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter water from the same opening? Can a fig tree, Cameron, bear olives or a grape tree bear or a grapevine bear figs? Thus does a spring also give salt water and fresh water? Cameron, let it not be so with you. If you think about what Jesus said all of his life, he never once spoke something that God didn't tell him to speak. He never once didn't speak the word of God. Here's one of our weapons, the word of God. How much of this word do we know? And how much of this word do we speak even when our mind is seeing or our mind is hearing something in opposition to it. God wants you to speak his word, not the word of death, not the word of the enemy. Let his word sink deep into your soul. And then this little muscle, this little, this little voice box, this little contraption that the Lord gave us to, to verbalize, 
if you think about it, we just verbalize what's in here. And when you speak, people know if it's truth or if it's not. They know if it came from your heart or not. You, you know when the salesman is lying. You know when you're lying. You don't even believe it yourself. <laughs> Let God change how we talk. Next time, we'll dig in a little bit deeper. Join us Thursday at 6.30. Let the Word of God change the way you think. A friend of ours gave us a great Bible app. Um, it is called Bible.is. Is Bible.is. You can get on Android or Apple. And you can just download that app. You can go to it and just listen to the Word of God. It just It's a dramatized version of the Word of God. On your way to work, instead of listening to CNN, why don't we listen to the Word of God? Instead of just being on the phone constantly with, with our friends talking about nothing, let's hear the Word of God. Let's let that Word of God sink into our heart. And all of a sudden, we'll start to speak the Word of God. And we'll go, where'd that come from? Oh, it came from our heart. Well, how did our heart change the Word of God? Father, we love you and we bless you. And God, we declare that we are your spokesperson. We are your spokesmen and spokeswomen. Spokeswomen. God, <laughs> we are here for you. So speak to us so that you could speak through us. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. See you Thursday, 6.30, same place. God bless you. Bye-bye.